Hello and welcome to the interview series of Stevens Leadership Portal, presented by the School of Business at Stevens Institute of Technology. These conversations explore compelling topics at the intersections of leadership, innovation, and inclusivity. I'm Dr. Wei Zheng, Richard R. Rossett Endowed Chair Professor in Leadership at Stevens. Lisa Mascolo, a Stevens alumnus and current trustee of Stevens, has served in many senior leadership roles, such as managing director at IBM, executive vice president at United Health, CEO of Optimos, and founding partner at Accenture. She has founded Listen, Learn, Lead to provide executive coaching and leadership development services to small and large businesses. She supports Teach for America, Room to Read, and the Women in Military Service to America Memorial, among other philanthropic engagements. In this interview, Lisa talks about how technology is not for its own ends, but an enabler of problem solving. She also talks about the leader's job as listening, learning, and teaching, in addition to leading, how a leader needs to be both effective and admired, both confident and empathetic, and know what to do when they don't know what to do during disruptive times. Let's have a listen. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I really appreciate you giving us the time to share your leadership experience and insights. Happy to do so. Could you start by giving us a brief overview of your career history? Sure. I had worked as a young kid, and I think of this as part of my career history, for a woman who taught me how to ride, horseback riding. And she was a really important influence in my life. And she was a really important influence in my decision to pursue college and a career. I went to Stevens. My undergraduate degree from Stevens was in a curriculum at the time called Systems Planning and Management. And when I graduated, I was attracted to the consulting field because I liked the idea of not necessarily knowing exactly what I was going to be doing every single day. And consulting has that sort of allure and appeal. I think the reality is probably slightly different. Nonetheless, I went to work for what at the time was Arthur Anderson, which was known primarily as an audit and accounting and tax firm, although they had just started a consulting division and it was the consulting division that I joined uh, when I graduated. And I spent almost 30 years with that company. The consulting group ultimately became Anderson Consulting and then ultimately became Accenture. Accenture's now uh, probably close to a 50 or $60 billion a year enterprise. And I spent all of my time, virtually all of my time at Anderson Consulting and Accenture in the public sector, which is to say all of my clients and the work that we do and Accenture still does today is largely in and around IT. All of my clients were public sector clients, government clients. So I spent, as I said, almost 30 years at Accenture. I retired uh, from Accenture, took a little bit of time off. I took the job of CEO of a small DC-based IT company, primarily focused on serving the federal government. I was the CEO for two and a half years and then I did what I always intended to do, which was to hang out a shingle and spend my time doing leadership development and executive coaching sort of one-on-one with individual clients. I like to say I was quite happily doing that until a recruiter called me in late 2015, friend of mine at a large retained search firm. And she said, hey, I've got the perfect job for you. And I said, yeah, you're confused. (laughs) I already have the perfect job. You know, some days I don't work. Some days I roll out of bed at nine o'clock. I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. And she called me back a month later and she said, no, they'd really like to talk to you. And it turned out it was IBM and it was leading the public sector business in the US. So the federal government and the state and local governments. And it was really an opportunity given my passion for the public sector. It was really an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And I executed that role for three and a half years, decided it was time to let the next generation of leaders step up. I felt like I had done a decent job of coaching and grooming them to take on the leadership. And then I spent another probably nine months with IBM working on some global corporate leadership and culture issues and left IBM at the end of March of this year. So that's kind of the snapshot. What are some formative experiences that have influenced who you are, who you have been, and what you have been doing? As I said, I am passionate about the public sector. I contemplated on a couple of occasions actually going into government service. And I have this conversation all the time with my government clients, you know, where can you make the biggest difference? Is it on the inside being a government employee?
story? Is mm-hmm. it on the outside banging against it? And the conclusion mm-hmm. I came to was that actually it's the marriage of the two. It's the government officials aligned with external consultants, service providers. When you get that right marriage, you get to drive a lot of really important benefits. And my passion for the public sector really came as a result of my paternal grandfather, who was a civil servant. He worked in the city of New York, and he was what I like to call 311 on feet. If you know 311 today in most cities or most major cities, you can dial 311 non emergency and get help, get information. And this was obviously a long time ago, but I would accompany him in the summer. We got to spend some time with my grandfather when we were not in school as kids, little kids, my sister and I, and we'd go with him to the office. And he'd go into the office in the morning and he'd pick up a pile of tickets, trouble tickets. And his job was to go figure out what the issue was and figure out how to resolve it. And I saw him doing just that, right? Talking mm-hmm. to people, understanding what the issues were and figuring out how to use the resources of the government to solve those problems. And when I left Stevens and went to Arthur Anderson in the consulting division, I said, I said, well, where do you want to work? You know, JP Morgan, Mars Candy. I said, no, I want to do government work. And at the time, there wasn't really a lot of government work, but I got that bug. And for me, that was a formative experience, you know, being with my grandfather. And as I mentioned earlier, my other passion, certainly as a, as a kid, as a young adult, and even today was horseback riding. And I spent all my free time at the barn. My father decided when I was four years old that I was a bit of a troublemaker (laughs) and he was going to, you know, take me to a place and make sure I understood what it meant to have responsibility, to learn. And I don't think he expected the extent to which I would, you know, become passionate about horses and riding. And that experience, you know, every non-school, non-waking moment I spent in the barn, taking care of horses, ultimately teaching kids, learning responsibility, the woman that I rode for and worked with, she was, I think she was way ahead of her time uh, in mm-hmm. terms of women business owners. Mm-hmm. And she embodied, in my view, what it took to be a consummate business person and still be empathetic, um, still be able to spend time with people and horses um, and get the best out of them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the things I learned from her was, to me, was really important the way she taught. And she really taught me that the job is to be a teacher. And mm-hmm. She was big on, you know, listening and observing before coming to conclusions. And I think the probably the third sort of set of formative experiences was my home life. Not that it was third in the list, but I'd probably argue it was third in the list. My parents were really committed to us doing what we were passionate about and making sure that we understood that in order to achieve, you had to work hard. Mm -hmm. And both my parents worked uh, and they both worked hard and they played hard too. They enjoyed their friends. So I think that was, you know, it was really those three sets of experiences that I think were really formative for me. Those are really interesting experiences. Then later, in terms of education, you um, got a bachelor's degree in systems planning and management from Stevens. How has that background influenced you in your career? It was sort of ahead of its time when I went into Stevens. I expected to start as a physics major, frankly, Mm -hmm. um, and found out those people were way smarter than I was. And I think my first year on campus was the first year they offered the systems planning and management uh, mm. curriculum. And so I, you know, I jumped on it and switched. And it's a lot like what I said about the woman that I rode for. Her name, by the way, was Natalie Johnson. It, it's very similar in that what I think the thing that I learned most was analysis and problem solving, how to think logically about problems, even when they didn't appear to be logical, mm. and also how to use my intuition and resources around just about the logic of solving a problem. It's about the art of solving a problem. And while I, you know, I always tell people who are thinking about going to Stevens, you know, while I don't, I don't use, you know, vectors was a great class. I love that class. And fluid dynamics, fascinating stuff. I don't use that stuff Mm -hmm. in terms of my day-to-day work, whether that's leadership or management or operations. And that class work was informative and formative in that I really had to figure out how to solve problems and address things that I didn't know how to do. And I think that's a fundamental point that we're missing in leaders today. Um, We don't teach leaders how to to do when they don't know what to do. Could you say more on that? Yeah, I think the pandemic and other situations are kind of emblematic of that, right? As a leader, I have, in my mind, 
what I view as a decision-making framework. And mm -hmm. decisions that you have to make as a leader go from the simple to the complicated, to the complex, to chaotic. And frankly, beyond chaos is disorder. Um, mm -hmm. And I like studying chaos and disorder. I think we need to do a lot more of that because too many of our leaders, when confronted with a very different situation, don't know what to do. We haven't taught them how, we haven't been actively engaged in saying, hey, what are you going to do when you don't know what to do? And there's real things to do when you don't know what to do. And this is not a topic, in my view, that we spend a lot of time on or nearly enough time. And you see it, whether that's in governmental leaders or corporate leaders or in other places. While we were able to react relatively quickly in certain areas to the pandemic, use that as the example, I still think that there are areas where leaders failed to step up and spent too much time trying to figure it out, right? My decision-making framework. You know, when the situation is simple, the leader has the opportunity and I think the obligation to listen and learn and then make a decision. I'm not necessarily about consensus management. I am though about taking advantage of all the resources around you when the situation affords you that luxury, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got the luxury of time as a leader, you should engage. You should listen and learn from other people. As you move from that left end of the spectrum, from the simple to the chaotic, you better have had the right experience experiences, the right teaching, better have built the right relationships with the people. Because when you get to the right end of that spectrum, as the leader, even when lives aren't at stake, like in corporate America, even when lives aren't at stake, when the situation is chaotic, as a leader, you have to be able to step up to the plate and hit the ball out of the park, which for me means it has to be the right order, it has to be the right directive, and people have to believe that it's the right order and the right directive in order to execute it. We don't spend enough time thinking and talking about decision making making situational decision making. So do you have an example uh, in your career, either you have done it or you have seen other leaders done it in terms of when they absolutely know that they don't know what to do, but they did something following a process or following their intuitively built knowledge base in terms of doing specific things that they can do to try to figure out the situation? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so uh, I can't tell you the specific client, but I can tell you the situation. And the situation was that as a result of a human error, and it was a human error on mm. a team that was working underneath me, a really important system supporting a government function crashed, for lack of a better word. And the first thing you have to do is to understand, to know the impact that a crash like that is going to have. And if you don't know the impact, it's because you haven't been involved. And so one of the things that you have to do when you're charged with being a leader is understand the risks associated with everything that's in your purview. And when I understood what the system was um, and what the crash was and what the implications were, as soon as I heard that that particular system crashed, and this is not about me, but as soon as I heard that particular system crashed, the absolute first thing in that case I did was call my client. And people are like, oh my God, you can't call the client. You know, we've got to figure, absolutely not. In that case, you need to call the client. You need to put a, you know, a, a war room together. You need to put a team together. You need the right people with the right skills immediately on it, figuring out, doing the triage. And we basically got it fixed in about six hours, probably mm. six hours longer than the client wanted it to take. And I believe that that was about as quickly as it could have been fixed because we understood ahead of time what the implications of that thing going down were and we were prepared to do that. Mm. And I think, as I said, we don't spend enough time, we spend a lot of time gyrating in place as operators, managers, and even some leaders gyrate in place. I would argue that then those people aren't actually leaders, but we need to be a lot more intentional and thoughtful about future events, right? The, yeah. the idea of the black swan is really what this is. This point is about, right? Mm -hmm. Putting locks on the cockpit doors after 9-11 is sort of not really helpful, mm -hmm. right? The lock should have been on the doors. Somebody should have been thinking about what are the catastrophic risks. And not to say that we don't do war gaming, but we also don't do war gaming enough in small enough situations 
situations that become big disasters. And it's a hell of a lot easier to say this stuff, I think, than mm-hmm. it is to do. And until and unless we're really intentional and thoughtful, we're going to continue to see bad things happen, unfortunately. But mm-hmm. I think it's, you know, it's incumbent on the leader to be thinking about the future, both in terms of setting mm-hmm. the vision, the strategy, the direction, and all that stuff that leaders are supposed to do, as well as Um, thinking about the challenges, the bad things that could happen. So from a leadership development perspective, what are some ways people can pick up those important skills to, to enjoy normal times? I can immediately think about, for example, taking coursework in crisis management or doing for leaders to practice doing uh, scenario planning, for example, anticipating yep. potential risks. Anything else they could do during normal times to prepare for those times where they have absolutely have very little to follow and it's a chaotic situation? Yeah. I'm always surprised in a chaotic situation how many times a bit of information that I heard at some point in the past becomes valuable. Had I not taken the time in the simple times to listen, my teams will tell you um, I'm sort of famous for never turning down a conversation. If somebody wants to have a conversation with me about something that they think is important, I'm not just going to talk about the weather, but if, if there's something that they think is important or something they want to explore or something they're not certain about or something they dislike, when you have the luxury of time, Time, you should always have those conversations. I think too many leaders think they don't have the time to do that. My view mm-hmm. is they don't have the time not to do that. Those mm-hmm. become very valuable conversations. The broader question, the thing that has to happen, the whole curricula, in my view, around leadership and leadership development has to focus on this topic of what to do when you don't know what to do. That's a good point. Very it, needs to be, it needs to be a plank of the leadership platform. Absolutely. And this is related to one of the things you mentioned during our first conversation. You were asking me, are, are you differentiating between leadership or management or operation, right? Is this right. related to that? Yeah, there's a big difference. I would argue that too many people who have the title of leader mm-hmm. are actually managers or even operators. There's nothing wrong with being an operator or being a manager. They're just not leaders. And leaders are people who have to set the strategy and the vision, and they have to recognize that as a leader, they serve at the pleasure of the led. If the people who are following the leader don't like the leader, don't think the leader's doing a good enough job, they'll walk, especially in a corporate setting, you know, they'll vote with their feet. They'll walk from the leader. The leader can't get done. So if you run a, you know, in my business, in the IT, business. If if you run a system test team and there's four people on the team and two of them, because you haven't given them the proper direction, let's say two of them screw up, you could work hard. You could probably work really hard and fix what they screwed up. When you lead a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 people, you can't Mm -hmm. fix what they don't get done. So Mm -hmm. the leader's job is to set the vision the strategy, the direction, and then to capture the hearts and the minds of the people and move them in that direction. If the leader doesn't understand that he or she serves at the pleasure of the lead and their job is to capture their, you know, I like to see, say head, heart, and gut to move them in the direction you're, you're not a leader. The simplest definition of a leader is somebody who has followers. Mm -hmm. And if they're unwilling to follow, you're not much of a leader. And that's very different than managing, which is setting a schedule, being in the details, right? My example before about the system that crashed, I was absolutely in the details. And I'm not in the details of everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. That's the job of you know, the people who report to the leader and the people who report to them and the people who report to them. The leader can't be in the details of everything. Otherwise, the leader's stifling progress and is not a leader. That's a manager. Somebody who needs to be in the details of everything probably has a trust issue and probably hasn't taught their people well enough. Leader's job is to let the people step up in the appropriate manner and take on responsibility. I view, I always view my job as a leader is, you know, eyeballing my successors. Who's going to take my job? So let's discuss your career experience in terms of um, milestones, successes, and failures. I'm particularly interested in your, how did you emerge as a leader? You mentioned leaders, you have followers. When did you notice people were following you or what did you do to emerge as a leader? I I was having a conversation with some graduating master students the other day. And one thing they wanted me to ask my interviewees is how did they emerge as leaders? How did you get other people to see you as leaders? Um, So how did you emerge as a leader in your experience? 
I wouldn't say that it's, I wouldn't say that it's accidental. I do think there are people who say in a very altruistic sense, take maybe like a Martin Luther King or John Lewis, right? John Lewis for me is a great example. And I love, I love the John Lewis story. I actually have the original artwork. If you've Mm. seen the John Lewis preaching to the chickens point, I actually have that original Mm. artwork. That was a young man who at a very young age felt the calling to move people felt that what he felt and what he thought and what he had to say could move people. And he practiced that. He practiced preaching to the chickens. And that's Mm -hmm. where that comes from. In his Mm -hmm. yard, he he preached to the chickens. And he had, I think he fundamentally had a calling and he believed in his ability to move people to the good. Mm -hmm. So that absolutely happens. I think in business, while there are probably people who say, I'm going to be a great leader, Mm -hmm. I do think it's a natural evolution or progression. And it starts with, I think, an ethic, especially in my business, an ethic around client service, right? The leader's job is about clients and people, not about shareholders. It's about clients and people. And so, you know, as a young person, I was one of 10 coders, right? I was on a program for the state of New York, Mm -hmm. uh, the statewide accounting system in Albany in God knows what year, 1980 something. And in order to do my job properly, I felt like I had to have conversation. I knew I had to have conversation with the clients and the guys that I worked for said, you need to go have a conversation with the client about, you know, this thing and figure out how we're going to make it work. And so you do, you have a conversation with the client about whatever the thing is and how you're going to make it work. And you ask questions and you think about it and you formulate a plan and an answer and you share it with people. Sometimes what happens is you're good at that. And the people who see you see you're good at that. And they say, Hey, you were pretty good at that. Why don't you do it again? You know, over here. And instead of, you know, you spending 12 hours a day doing that, why don't you spend six hours a day doing the conversation with the client? and then have the conversation with two of these people who will now be your team. And so you move from leading yourself, which is the fundamental tenet of leadership in my view, leading yourself, to leading others and bigger groups of others. And you hope along the way that you get good coaching and mentorship and that the people around you tell you when you're doing a good thing, when you're doing a bad thing, feedback is essential. Um, And you got to have your own point of view about what kind of leader you want to be. I am, you know, for me, servant leadership is really important. And I don't mean that in any sort of religious sense per se. It is about understanding that leadership is a service calling, service to your clients, service to your people, and and ultimately, yes, in the corporate setting, service to the shareholders or the, you know, the stakeholders. But it's learned for most people. It doesn't come naturally to everybody like it did to a guy like John Lewis, who had a natural gift for the vision and the ability to move people. And that's fundamentally what the leader's got to do, right? You've got to move people and you learn how to move people. There's a lot of storytelling in leadership and there's a lot of listening in leadership. How do you listen? A lot of people talk about being a good listener and listen well, what are the secrets of listening that can move people? You actually have to mean it, right? People who hear and don't listen, I have limited time for them. You actually have to want to hear what somebody has to say. And you actually have to believe that there's value to you and to them Mm -hmm. in having a conversation and listening to what they have to say. Because it's the interaction. Somebody might come to a leader and say, hey, um, geez, I've been experiencing this and it doesn't feel very good or I don't like it. And this is what I think we ought to do about it. I love to say to my guys, I'm okay with a squeaky wheel. It'd just be nice if occasionally the squeaky wheel showed up with its own oil can. We might not use your can of oil, but somebody who comes with a problem and a perspective on the solution, you really want to listen to those people because they care and you'll have a conversation and you'll probably end up in a different place than either one of you thought when you first started the conversation. But effective listening is because you want to listen and you want to learn as a result of listening. So coming back to your career line, um, what are some major successes and failures you've experienced as sort of some milestones that helped you grow into a better leader? I would argue that you learn most from the failures. Mm -hmm. You learn most from the failures, right? Success is, you know, and I was a terrible coder, by the way. They were happy to stop me from coding stuff because I was really a bad coder. The successes are, they sort of come, right? You learn, it doesn't mean you do everything perfectly, but Mm -hmm. success comes, right? You do a thing, somebody says it's okay but you might think about doing it this way and then you go do it that way I think you learn a lot from the failures and I I like to cook a lot too if I don't drop not the plate itself but the stuff on the plate if I don't shove you know at least one meal or one component of one meal down the disposer every week (laughs) my view is I'm not trying hard enough I'm not experimenting I'm not trying new things Mm -hmm. Um, so failure is you know when people say failure is not an option it means you've gotten to a place where you shouldn't be in the first place we need to learn from our failures 
failures and I've had some, I love to say I've had some epic failures and, you know, I can remember what I call my very first epic failure. And I was probably, I was like four years old in uh, still Arthur Anderson at the time. So I was what we would have referred to as a as a senior consultant. And I had a small team and we were redesigning a part of the state of New Jersey's unemployment system. And in those days, you know, there weren't a lot of tools. And so you were doing the design, the flow of the system with a little flowchart template and 80 column spreadsheet paper. And we had worked on this redesign probably for, I don't know, three weeks. And I was presenting it to my boss's boss. She would, she would ultimately become one of the first female partners in the consulting division of Arthur Anderson. And she was not the nicest person, but I was determined that, you know, we had done a really good design and we fundamentally missed a real Really important point because we misunderstood a conversation with the client. And so the guts of the design was wrong. It was basically wrong. So we had wasted three weeks. And she calls me into her office and she takes a piece of paper, a little five by eight piece of paper that sat, you know, like a notepad in a little plastic dish. She pulled out one of these pieces of paper and she was famous for using her blue felt marker. And while she's screaming at me and redrawing the process because she's using this blue felt marker. I still have the paper somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's just covered. It bleeds. It's just blue ink when she's done and she throws it at me and she says, now that's what you should have designed in the first place. Go do that. And I picked up my, you know, pile of 80 column spreadsheet paper, this tiny little piece of paper that had blue ink on it, went in the bathroom, locked the door and cried for 20 minutes. And it taught me two things. One, what I would never do if I were in her position. And two, we didn't really listen to the client. We didn't really hear the client. And we didn't ask enough questions to make sure we actually were on the same page saying the same thing. And that was a, you know, that was a pretty epic fail. And you learn a lot from those failures, good and bad, what to do differently and what not to do when it's your turn. You know? mm -hmm. And I'm, for me, that was a really formative experience. So let's imagine, let's do a thought experiment. So let's imagine you are her in a similar situation. Someone else made a big mistake. What would you do differently? So what I would do differently is the entire process. And, and that's not a cop-out answer. This was a really important part of the system and what should have happened both on my part and on her part would have been a check-in. Two days into the client interview process, we should have had a check-in wherein she might have said, hang on, I I've been doing this for a long time and she had. I don't think that's how that's supposed to work. You need to go back to the client and make sure you guys are on the same page talking about the same thing. So I'd like to think that we can prevent epic failures mm -hmm. from being better leaders throughout the process. Does that always happen? No, it doesn't happen because I, you know, the story I told you before about the system crashing, it was a human error. And it's not about pointing fingers. It's about understanding the implications and figuring out how to fix it. Um, it's about being truthful about what happened to cause the epic failure and making sure that we learn from that so we don't do it again. So what about when you're facing that conversation? What if the failure is done and it's a big failure and, and this person walks into your office? How would you do conduct this conversation in a way that is you're not screaming, and but, but you still make it a point, an important point, helping this person realize how big a mistake is that and what they can do differently. I think in those situations, most people understand that it's a really big deal and they've really made a mistake. If it's willful and negligent and you come to that conclusion through investigation, then it's one conversation. It's not willful and it's not negligent. And we understand how the mistake got made. It's about fixing the mistake, right? And in the case of the, you know, the system going down, the one that I mentioned earlier, it cost the company money because we had to, that was part of our contract, right? Mm -hmm. If the thing goes down for an extended period of time, you're going to get penalized or fine. Is that great? No. Do you take it out of some individual's paycheck? No. Because fundamentally, I view those things as a failure of leadership. The conversation that you have with somebody is, hey, let's say in the case it's human error. Tell me what happened. You know, help me understand how you think this happened and how do you think it could have been prevented and what do we do differently in the future? There's no value. It's like kids, right? I don't know if you've got kids, but yes. I mean, you can scream at your kid and they'll get scared and they'll stop doing whatever it is that they're doing at the moment, but mm -hmm. it doesn't change their behavior, right? To me, it's about behavior modification. If it was, you know, bad process, bad behavior that caused the failure, we need to go back and understand why it happened, 
and what we need to do differently. Screaming at somebody is not going to modify behavior. It might in the moment, but it doesn't actually help them learn and do better the next time. Good point. Thank you for sharing that. So let's talk about your、uh, technical consulting role, which is interesting. So you have worked in different organizations. IBM is sort of technology and also healthcare organization, and, and before that, you were a consultant,、um, probably working with different organizations and types of organizations. But you, in our conversation, you you talked about your role being a technical consulting role through. Throughout these different organizations, could you say more about that? How do you see that role, and what are some strategies for you to get better and better in that role? Yeah. You know, so when I say technical, and that might not have been my best word choice, I, what I really mean is IT, right? All of the consulting work that I've done,、mm. whether it was. You know, Accenture and its predecessor companies, or as the CEO of an IT company, or、mm-hmm. leading the IBM consulting business. It's all about IT, right? It's all about systems. You know, helping our clients solve their problems. And 99.9% of the time, when we're helping our clients solve their problems, there's IT involved. Whether it's building a new system, remediating something, there's IT involved. So that's really what I meant by、mm-hmm. technical. It's really IT, and that's the enabler. IT is the enabler. So it's not really about it's not really about the details of the tech, which I certainly understood. Right, one of the things which always makes some of my people laugh because they don't think I have much technical skill.、Um, I actually wrote a compiler. Right, I suspect ninety percent of the people out there who are in IT don't even know what a compiler is. I wrote an Ada compiler as my senior project at Stevens. So you need to have at a level you need to have some detailed technical chops. You need to understand what the teams are doing so you can ask a pro. Appropriate questions, but to me, this the technology is strictly the enabler. Consulting is about solving problems. It's about understanding the problem. It's about figuring out what the solutions are. How do you bring those solutions to bear in an efficient manner? Because government doesn't have, you know, as a taxpayer, I hope the government doesn't spend money like water. We've got a responsibility to make sure we present solutions that are effective and efficient. So, what are some learning you have gained in this role, being the IT consulting in? Enabler. So, what about this enabler role? How do you get it better? Because a lot of our graduates and our current students too are very strong in this technical role. How can they become better enablers? Yeah. So, I think that the question there is, you know, do those folks have a perspective on their long-term aspirations? If somebody wants to be a database designer、mm-hmm. forever and ever and ever and ever, because it's a thing that they're passionate about and they want to get smarter about it, they want to produce better products. That's a great thing.、Mm-hmm. If somebody wants to be database designer. Because it will teach them how to think and solve problems and use that as a stepping stone to manage others and ultimately lead others. That's great too. I think it really depends on the individual. Technology is strictly an enabler. Technology is what enables you, as a consultant anyway, to deliver a solution to a client. Again, whether it's you know building a system to launch a rocket or building a system to answer taxpayer questions without having to have a human being, whatever the system is, the technology. Is what makes that happen, but it's not the be all and end all. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's technology as an enabler of a solution. So, what about for the latter group of people you mentioned, the group who's interested in using their technical skills backgrounds to jump off into leadership positions? What are some things you would recommend them do to help with that transition? I would go back to some of the things we've talked about, which is to understand that in order to lead, you have to have a perspective about the clients that you're serving. And the people who are going to help you serve those clients, and even if you're in an internal, you know, JPMC's IT department, or as a consultant outside of an organization, it has to be about listening to hear what the real problem is, and then figuring out what the solution is. It has to be about making the client and your team successful. And I think that's true whether you call it consulting or you're a chemical engineer for Dupont. There's always a Thing to be done. There's a problem to be solved. There's something that needs to get done. You could do it yourself individually and work on it 12 hours a day. You could be deploying a team to work on a whole bunch of those problems 12 hours a day. Interesting. So last time when we talked, we talked about leadership, and you said, "I quote: the holy grail of leadership is to be both effective and admired." Which is, I think, it's a very insightful point. But could you talk about that? I think there's language challenges. I think one of the most important words in the English language, in any language, however you say the word in whatever language, that word is "and." It's a tiny little、mm-hmm. word. 
It's only got three letters. And people sometimes present themselves with false choices. They present others with false choices. When somebody says, do you want me to do this or that? Just tell me which one. Well, no, actually, no. I probably need you to do both. And we need mm -hmm. people to think about whatever the situation is. We need people to think and. We need people to think both. Being effective without being admired is not leadership. Being admired without being effective is not mm -hmm. leadership. In order to be a leader, i.e. to get a thing done, mm -hmm. right? Again, whether it's leading yourself, leading others, leading a company or a country, whatever it is, you need to be both effective, which means you get the job done. You get done what you're charged with getting done mm -hmm. and you do it in a manner that resonates with the people who are around you. I think leaders have to be, you know, I use three words, credible mm -hmm. and passionate and they have to really understand themselves as a leader in order to be effective and admired. When did you realize that? Were there events or successes or even challenges that made you realize or start to focus yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of a long time in coming. It's evolutionary. It's certainly, you know, thoughts that were kicking around in the back of my head when I was sitting in that bathroom crying, right? She was effective. She made mm -hmm. me understand what I didn't do right, but I certainly didn't admire the approach. What are some other good ways of gathering leadership skills? You know, all the obvious things, right, is asking questions, observing, reading, just actively determining that you want to be a better leader is probably the first step. People who just sort of tumbleweed from one experience to another, you know, get asked to get something done, they get it done, they get asked to get a bigger thing done and a bigger thing and a bigger thing, and then pretty soon they're, you know, a leader. To me, that's a tumbleweed experience. It's not an intentional and thoughtful experience. And I, whatever it is that you want to get done, I think people should be intentional and thoughtful about it. Being a better leader requires intent and thought to be a better leader. Asking questions, reading stuff, talking to people, trying out theories, operating in a court, you know, having a, I like strict, having a strict set of things that you adhere to and being consistent, right? Mm -hmm. Leaders need to be consistent. Doesn't mean you don't evolve. Doesn't mean your points of view don't morph over time because they clearly do. You need to be consistent. You need to be credible. So I'd like to transition a little bit and and ask you some questions about being a woman in technology. You have written and spoken on this topic. Could you share a little bit about your own experience as a woman in tech and what challenges have you experienced and how have you navigated them? I think we, you know, I'd call it my generation. I think we had some understanding of the struggles of the generations of women before us. I'm not mm -hmm. sure we had as much of an appreciation for them as we should have. Mm -hmm. And that probably colored some things. And and I think we do a crappy job of teaching the current generations of young women what the generations before them had to do and go through in order for them. Right? I think we talk to most young, certainly professional women today. Most of them are probably pretty convinced that they could do whatever they want to do. And that's not really actually borne out by the facts. One of the things that we still absolutely face at least in a corporate setting, and even in a big academic setting, is the patriarchy, is the hierarchy, is largely male dominated. And I'm, you know, married to a man, I love my husband, I love my two sons. You know, men aren't evil. And the patriarchy, the system that we've all grown up in for generations and generations and generations is a fact. We saw it today, I don't know if you saw it in the news, can't remember what her name is, just become the, you know, the 35th Fortune 500 female CEO. So, so yes, Yippie. I saw that. I can't remember her name either. Yeah. Well, the okay, so name. Yippie, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yippie, right? What that means is 7%. 7% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. It's a failure, in my view, which is why I got into the leadership development and executive coaching sort of one-on-one. -on -one. We, we, broadly, we, the Royal, we do a very poor job of coaching and mentoring women because most of the people who are charged with coaching and mentoring women are men. If somebody provides feedback that says, hey, you're doing a great job, just keep on doing it. That's useless. It's not actionable. And, mm -hmm. and we need to teach young women how to ask for feedback and mm -hmm. how to get good feedback. 
How do you do that? Could you share one or two advice? Yeah. First, you need to fairly and accurately assess your own strengths and weaknesses. You should have a perspective on what you're good at, what you're not so good at, what you're mm-hmm. passionate about, what you want to get better at. You should have a perspective on your own performance. Grade your own performance and ask for feedback. You can't pigeonhole somebody, whether your boss is a man or a woman. You can't say, hey, when you come in contact with them in the hall, hey, tell me how I'm doing. If you put somebody on the spot, they're going to react and you'll probably get, <laughs> you're doing a great job. Just keep at it. You know, you're not my problem. Just keep doing a great job. Again, not helpful feedback. So I think going into a conversation about performance, having your own point of view on performance, or even sending it to somebody ahead of time and saying, hey, in anticipation of our conversation next week or the week after, I I've lined out what I think I've done well because bosses don't always have a level of detail either that they need. You know, I've lined out what I've been working on for the last three months. Here's mm-hmm. the things I think I did really well. Here's the things I need to improve on. Here's what I want to do. You know, I like the idea of going to that sort of a conversation prepared and giving the other person something to respond to with an appropriate amount of time. That's good advice. Anything else? Yes. I mean, you, I do think it's important that we are our Our biggest critic and our biggest fan. You know, and I don't like stereotyping or generalizing. And in general, you know, women in team leader, manager, and even leadership roles will say, it's not about me, it's about my team. To me, that's another one of these false or choices. It is about my team and it's about me. It's mm-hmm. about my ability to set the vision and the direction and move the team to get it done. We don't teach women to take appropriate personal credit as well as credit for what the team accomplishes. Well, my last question have to do with this another holy grail of professional women, which is work-life balance. What was your experience like maybe when your kids were younger? How did you go through that? My one point on work-life balance, and I sort of, I said it not flippantly one day and somebody, I, it was poorly phrased. I said, I don't believe in work-life balance. Mm-hmm. And before I could get to the other half of the sentence, they were all over me. One, it's personal. And two, I think it's about integration. I only ever had have and had one to-do list. I'm not two people... I can't split myself in two. And plenty of days when, you know, kids lacrosse game was mm-hmm. number one on the list. Mm-hmm. Plenty of times I was in Germany or some other place or China when the kids lacrosse game was happening and I didn't go. Um, it's personal. You need to decide what's appropriate for you and your family. But I don't, I'm, you know, if somebody asked me for advice, I'd say just make one list, not mm-hmm. two. How do you decide what's on that list? You talked about, well, you change it, adapt it to the current situation. Do you have any rules of thumb for yourself when you make those decisions? Um, fly by the seat of your pants, gut. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, no. I mean, yes and no. You know from a professional standpoint what's critical. And you try to plan, too. I mean, planning, mm. you do have to have some approach to a plan. You do have to be, my two other favorite words, intentional and thoughtful. You know, you can't show up on a day and say, except in the case of an emergency, obviously, you can't mm-hmm. show up on a day and say, hey, I'm going on vacation for two weeks tomorrow. How's that sound, right? That doesn't work. Mm. You need to be intentional and thoughtful. You need to have a plan. I believe sometimes you decide that the work thing is most important, and other mm-hmm. times you decide that the family thing is most important. And that's personal. And it's okay to shift. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, do you have any last words for our audience? I think when it comes to leadership, it's really important to be active, to mm. understand the situation that you're in and apply different skills depending on the situation. When you've got the luxury of time, the leader's job is absolutely to listen and learn mm. and to lead. I think the mm. leader's ultimate job is as a teacher. And I think the way that you do that in part is by being intentional and thoughtful and passionate. Leaders who aren't passionate won't be mm. effective and admired. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, do something else. You can't lead without having a passion for the environment, the topic, the agenda, the company, the cl- whatever it is. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, go figure out what you're passionate about and then you'll be really good at it. So identify an area of passion and do that intentionally and actively to pursue leadership. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate your wisdom. Okay, happy to help. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. You can find more compelling stories and evidence-based insights at the Stevens Leadership Portal website. Our purpose is to inspire new ways of thinking, leading, and problem-solving.